American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. Um, and she has done her specialization in child and adolescent psychiatry from the United States. And she worked there for 15 years. And the, for the last 15 years, she has been practicing in Islamabad. And she is also the founder member of Rosen, which is a national NGO. And it works on the issues of emotional health, gender, and violence against women and children. Um, with me is the president, Sinan. So I would like Sinan to start this meeting. Sinan, over to you. Yes, good evening, everybody. My name is Sinan Khalid Wahid. I'm a co-founder and president of Payam. I hope you all are taking care of yourselves during these uh, strenuous times that we live in. I'd just like to take this time to welcome you all on this platform. So the Project ECHO Youth Ambassadors Movement is essentially the youth arm of Project ECHO, which was founded by Dr. Sanjeev Arora at the University of New Mexico in the US. So we are the first ECHO Youth Ambassadors Movement anywhere in the world. And I'm proud to say that we are also the first student-led movement in Pakistan to focus solely on the important area of public health and disease prevention via education and uh, awareness. Our aim is essentially to make Payam a global movement and I hope you will all join us in our cause. I would just like to uh, thank you all again for joining us uh, today. And I would ex like to ex extend my special thanks to Shayar Tariq, who is the president of the Aitzen College Literary Society, um, Dr. Asa Chaudhary, who created Payam, Dr. Amna Asghar, who just spoke right now, um, who is our project echo lead for Payam. Then you have Essen Sohail Saab, uh, who is the director of Payam at Parsa Trust. Uzair Saab, who is, um, Uzair Saab and Haris Saab, who are both members of the Project ECHO team. Then Mr. Ali Hamza at Feroz Sons. And a special thanks to today's speaker, Dr. Imbri Nehmed, who has been generous enough to give us her time today. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And as you can see, this is all very new to me, and uh, 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 so I'm learning, and uh, I hope that we are together able to negotiate this today's meeting. Uh, so I'm going to be, uh, okay, so Uzair Sab, I'm again getting the same message which says the host is disabled. Uh, so I just say okay, and I say share screen. Okay, so it's not letting me share my screen for some reason. Um, Uzair Saab, can you help with this? Uzair, can you help uh, Dr. Ambreed in sharing the screen? Okay, there we go. Ma'am, uh, we have co-hosted you. Can you try it again, please? Yes, okay, I got it. Yes, okay. we have seen this. Yes, okay. ma'am, we are with you. We are seeing your slides. Okay, you are seeing my slides. Now I wish no, I could... No, not slides. We are seeing your inbox. No, you don't want to see my inbox. Okay. So I'm going to just... Uh... Okay. Okay, just stay with me. In a minute, we will get where we need to go. Uh, Okay, can you see these now? Uh, yes, ma'am, but not okay. in slide show mode. Okay, all right. Now, now it's okay? Yes, no, it's fine. All right, okay. Well, thank you. So you can, you can uh, all of those who are watching can probably tell that this is rather stressful for me uh, to, to uh, learn something that uh, I am not used to, but anyways, uh, let's uh, let's go ahead and um, let's talk a little bit about the objectives that we have that I would uh, uh, you know that I thought 
we would have for this uh, talk today. Basically, it's uh, sharing some information on stress and specifically as it relates to the current situation. And then also we will talk a little bit about all of you have coping mechanisms uh, and I'm sure you, you, uh, you can reflect on those and we can introduce some others that may be, may be new to you. And we can talk about some unhealthy coping mechanisms. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what is stress. And stress is, a, it's a word borrowed from physics actually. And basically it's any external pressure that's exerted on a malleable object to produce distortion or strain. And when we talk about stress in our lives, it's basically, it's any change that one has to adapt to or adapt, adjust to. And those changes can be good or bad or positive or negative. Um, so, so like you, you, know, you saw today, I said, I'm, I'm stressed. Uh, it was not because I'm not looking forward to talking to you, but simply because this is something new to me. So all stress is not bad. Uh, you know, in fact, there were, if there was no stress in our lives, we probably wouldn't learn new things. So stress is, uh, is okay. It's part of our lives. But I think what we need to kind of keep in mind is that if, if we were to just talk specifically about COVID-19 and this current situation and stress, to try and understand that, I think one of the things that we have to see is that suddenly we have been faced with numerous changes. So it's not just one change, but it's lots of changes. And it's happened suddenly. One day we were, uh, you know, we were leading a life. We were, yes, we were reading about coronavirus, maybe happening in China, maybe happening somewhere else, but it had not affected our lives here. And then suddenly it did. So of course there is the, the concern about our health, our own health, the health perhaps of our parents or our loved ones. And the life as we knew it, it has really been completely disrupted. So, you know, so your schools are closed, offices are closed. Uh, perhaps you're seeing uh, people that you're close to talking about the financial stress. And certainly, you know, if you, you know uh, people in our country who are going through enormous uh, financial difficulties, and then the way of interaction that we are used to has been disrupted also because, uh, you know, the people that we, we were used to meeting on an everyday basis, we are not, we can't meet them. The way we were meeting them also has changed. So we are keeping three feet away from them. So all of these things have been a lot, is a lot of change. At the same time, there is this uh, unpredictability. And human beings uh, like consistency. They, they like constancy. It sort of gives us a sense of control, a sense of safety. And when things get unpredictable, it kind of shakes us up a little bit. So obviously there are so many things that are unpredictable about this current situation. We don't know when it's going to end. We don't know when a vaccine will come out. We don't know whether we should be wearing masks. We should not be wearing masks. How many times should we be washing our hands? Um, when is this all going to end? We, nobody seems to know that. So all of this is very stressful. But I want to talk about specifically the youth because obviously this stress affects different age groups, different genders, uh, different people with different financial conditions differently. So certainly it affects youth differently. And, if I, and, and certainly you know much better than I do the kind of stresses you're going through and, and maybe you can share with each other as we are talking uh, what specific stresses you are feeling. But, you know, what, what I can gather um, is that obviously with uh, the way it affects the youth specifically is that this is, a, this is the time that you people are very much sort of uh, looking forward. There are, there are lots of things that you need to be planning, you need to be uh, taking decisions on, and all of that has been disrupted. I mean, not only your, your school has been disrupted or your college has been disrupted, but all of those kind of decisions have been, uh, have been disrupted. There is this, um, and the last years, whether, you know, if we are seniors, for example, if we are getting ready to graduate our O-levels or A-levels, 
you know, you look forward to these things for a long, long time. I mean, there are important milestones that we all look forward to, that we all know from experience. I mean, even I can remember my senior years. There was a long time ago, but I remember looking forward to my farewell party and kind of discussing how that would be. And so there are lots of milestones that we look forward to of saying, of moving on, of uh, all of that, suddenly we, we don't know how that's going to happen. There is this unpredictability about our future. And it just, you know, in, in the present scenario, I hear that, you know, you're, you don't know how, when your exams will happen, when will they take place, how will they take place. Uh, you know, there is this whole thing, this is the time when you're thinking about applying abroad, you're applying to colleges. Uh, when does, you know, will colleges open uh, on time? When will they open? How, how will your grades be affected? All of these things are very, very um, difficult and they cause stress. Uh, the other thing, of course, is the long-term stress as well. That, you know, we don't, in some ways, we, nobody seems to quite know what this post-corona, post-COVID-19 world is going to look like. Um, how, um, what, you know, what, what kind of careers will be important? What, will, what, what kind of careers will be in demand? We don't know. And we are guessing, all of us, you know, uh, what it's going to be like. And that's, that's extremely stressful. And the last thing I think is that, you know, at this age, I remember, and I think you all know that friends and your support circle and meeting out and hanging out with friends is very, very important. Um, this is a stage where, you know, in, in sort of psychological terms, we call it a separation individuation kind of phase where, um, where the youth starts to get ready for their future life. They start separating a little bit from their family uh, circle to establishing a circle outside. And that's a normal phase of life. But with, with this, that has been also disrupted. So I think there's a lot of disruption that has happened. And it's a very, very difficult time, uh, especially for the youth, especially because, you know, like I said, you are really looking ahead. You're, you need to make a lot of decisions. You, uh, so so, so that, that becomes extra uh, stressful. So these feelings that, that maybe all of you, some of you might be feeling of sadness, of anxiety, disappointment, or fear, these are absolutely, absolutely normal during this time um, if you are having them. And uh, if we talk a little bit about what are the practical things that you can, uh, that you can do to help yourself to manage the stress in this current situation, I think one uh, very basic thing that you probably read about as well is that you avoid overexposure to news. So, you know, it's good to keep abreast of the news, but I think if you do that once a day, that's good enough. You don't necessarily need to know the latest figures. You don't need to be constantly looking at TV or uh, listening to the latest update on this. That just is not good for our health. Uh, setting up a routine is extremely, extremely important. Like I said, it's, it's important for human beings to kind of have a consistency, a constancy in their life. So a routine helps us with that. So if we can set up a routine, we can follow it. That, that makes, uh, makes things easier. It's important to establish boundaries. Um, uh, I think that um, uh, boundaries about where, where we sleep, where we work, where we eat, are important in these days uh, to set up times for that. So that it's again helpful. Setting up small goals, so not expecting too much of oneself to understand that this, this is a difficult situation and that it may be uh, difficult to, um, to complete everything that you want to right away. So just setting up small goals and being happy that you're being able to achieve them, to give yourself a little credit uh, that you're going through a difficult time. Uh, you can try and learn something new. Just try try your hand at something that you've always wanted to do. 
exercise again is really, really important. Taking care of your physical health is very important. So eat well, drink enough water, uh, take care of your sleep schedule. Of course, staying connected. And I think you are much better at, at that than my generation is. I think you know, you know the techniques, you know the technology of staying connected. But it's really, really important uh, to stay connected with people that you feel are supportive of you. And the last thing is that's really important is that we must learn to practice self-compassion during these days. And by self, self-compassion, I really mean uh, being able to treat ourselves with more compassion, knowing that this is a difficult time. And I, I, I'm, I'm going to go through something a little bit of like an, like an exercise, and I want you to kind of come along with me on that and just think about it, that... Um, if you were to think that in the last uh, few days, have you, um, have you had a friend who has been in trouble or who has been depressed? And if you can just recall for yourself that uh, what did you say to this friend and how did you say it? And then I want you to think about a situation uh, in the last one week where you were not happy with your own self and you were feeling impatient and you were down. What did you say to yourself? And how did you say it? And I want you to notice if there was any difference. And if there was, I would like you to consider that because uh, oftentimes we are much more critical of with ourselves. We are much more harsh with ourselves than we are with other people. We talk in a much more harsher tone. Uh, with other people, we are more patient, we are more encouraging, we give them hope. And that's the way we want to talk to ourselves as well during this very difficult time. Um, and if you have talked to yourself with patience and encouragement and hope, then you're doing fantastic. Uh, so, uh, just some important points to keep in mind. One is that it's really, really important for all of us to believe in ourselves. Uh, I think we all need to remind ourselves that we've been through difficult times in our lives and we will go through this one as well. So to give ourselves hope, to not, not feel despondent. And the other thing is to accept the situation, to not, not go into either not be so paralyzed by it, not be so afraid of it, but at the same time, not deny its seriousness and not do things which are risky to, to understand that, yes, this is a serious situation and this is how it is right now. Um, I always uh, like something that I want to share with you. This is something that I repeat to myself a lot of times. This is a serenity prayer, which is often used. Um, it's used in the Alcoholics Anonymous, actually, but it's used by a lot of other people. And it says, oh God, give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference between the two. And I think here, we really, uh, it, it's important that we look at the things that we can change. And there are lots of things that we can change. We can certainly look at things that, you know, we can, there's nothing that stops us from planning ahead. There's nothing to, that stops us from hoping, from saying, okay, let's, we'll plan a party. Even if we can't have that farewell party, we can plan it. Uh, once all of this is over, we can, we can do things that are fun. So I think that, again, uh, to, to not, not give up to despondency. The other thing that, uh, one of the things that I want to kind of highlight in this talk today is, is resiliency. Now, resiliency is, is this ability that all of us have. So it's not unique. It's not something that just some lucky people have. Okay, it's all of us have it. This ability to bounce back when we are going through difficult times. We've all done it. So we know that we have it. It's a capacity in all of us. But the only thing is that it has to be deliberately harnessed. We have to say to ourselves, yes, we are going to use our resiliency. We are going to use that spirit in us 
that can bounce, that will help us bounce back. And we all have resources within us that, uh, uh, that, that are uh, sources of resiliency. So for example, individually, we have these resources. So all of us has, have personal characteristics, personal skills that have helped us in difficult situations before. Uh, so it's a question of just looking back and saying, what has given me strength when I've been through a hard time before? What has been my support? Uh, um, has it been nature? Has it been a particular friend? Has it been my own determination and my own stubbornness to fight through? So what is it in me? And we all have it. I, do I have some skills that always help me? Was it a sport? Is it a hobby? What is it that helps me. So to harness those resources. The community resources are those resources that are the circle in our community, people in our community, whether it's family or friends, who provide us support and who give us the ability to bounce back, to fight. So it's important, like I said before, it's important to make those connections to if you've forgotten somebody you haven't been in touch with them, get in touch with them. Because if they have been supportive to you, you can use that support. The existential um, resource, what do I mean by that? I basically, this is, again, this I think would, um, you can resonate with this because I think particularly at this age, we often ask, ask ourselves this question, you know, what is the meaning of my life? Uh, what is it that I really value? Uh, and I think that, you know, there are, there are, these will give us lots of uh, ideas because this is a time when actually you can look at, you know, what am, if I'm doing something, if I am not going out, if I'm sacrificing, why am I doing it? Uh, who is really benefiting from that? From that? Is my uh, taking precautions really saving the lives of some other people? So this is the, the time to think about that, that what you are doing is really uh, adding to a much bigger cause. Um, it's also the time to look at um, maybe uh, appreciating what you do have. You know, what is it that, we, that I can thank my, sort of thank or be, be grateful for at the end of each day? And we all have those things that we can be grateful for. Um, who are the people that I really need to appreciate right now that I've kind of forgotten, that I haven't thought about? Maybe I need to do that right now. So these are the resources that can, can help during this time. Um, okay, so now um, let me uh, move on to stress management. I'm sorry that I am not really looking at chat and I don't know whether you're saying anything there and if somebody else will tell me if something comes up there, um, but um, I am only looking at my screen. So if that's okay, um, I'll go on. So um, stress management uh, is something that is really uh, very key because it allows us, it's something that we all can learn and we can all improve upon. And certainly we all do it anyways. Um, but uh, uh, this is a time that we can start looking at it more seriously. So stress management techniques, these are, again, these are things that are very, very much backed by scientific research. Uh, they've, they're, so, so they're not something sort of hocus pocus. These are real techniques that have uh, been time tested. Um, but the most important element of stress management is one that we recognize and accept that yes, we are under stress and we need to make these, uh, this change in our life to actually start actively uh, uh, making some decisions about managing our stress. The other thing is that it's important to set goals. It's important to say that, you know, this is what I'm going to do. Um, to, uh, to manage my stress, this is the kind of technique that I want to learn. Okay, so this is really important. Uh, why should we manage stress? I think that, first of all, managing stress allows us to avoid emotional problems. It allows us to live in peace. It avoids uh, physical ill health. 
And of course, it allows us to be much more productive because if we are not struggling with our stress, then we have much more energy to put in our studies or our career or whatever it is that we are wanting to do. There are three basic sources of stress that are important to keep in mind. One is, of course, the environment. And I don't have to say very much about that because you know how the environment can, can create stress. And, and, you know, the current situation is a very good example of that. The other thing is the physiological um, sources of stress. And that's, you know, there are certain periods of our life uh, when physiologically we are more vulnerable, whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's old age or it's certain, just, you know, we are not well or something like that. Those are physiological sources of stress. And then our thoughts are uh, major sources of stress. And we'll talk a little bit more about that because that is really, really important to keep in mind. Um, so very quickly, those of you who have, who have uh, taken biology as a subject will, will be familiar with this, uh, the fight or flight response. And this is really nature's way. Uh, it was a, a protective package given by nature to, to f right when we, you know, la sort of, uh, uh, we go back in evolution. It was uh, our way to either when we came up with, with danger, so uh, what did we, the two choices that we had, we either could fight or we could uh, sort of run away from that. And so nature created this uh, uh, sort of reaction in our body where there was a series of very quick biochemical changes which prepared us to deal with these threats. Okay. Now at this point, this mobilizing response is no longer useful to us because we don't live in the jungle. We don't come across uh, wild animals who are suddenly ready to attack us. So in some ways, the, if we keep holding on to the stress, it's actually harmful to us both emotionally and physically. Okay, so this is where the early man is, is facing all these things which we are no longer facing. Uh, but if we look you know, uh, our bodies are still uh, responding the same way to stress. So if you look at all these things and you look at, for example, our, our pupils dilate when we are under stress or our saliva flow decreases, or for example, our, our, yeah, our heart starts beating faster, uh, our bowel movements slow down. So if you kind of look at these and you think, think about them, it's very, very clear that the, each one of these things is serving a purpose. If our pupils are dilating, that's because our body is saying, look, there's danger, so look carefully uh, around you. Okay? If our heart is beating fast, it's very clearly our body saying, there is some danger over here and you need to pump faster so more blood can get go to your muscles. Okay, And at the same time, if our food movement is slowing down, if our immune system is slowing down, it, it's because the body is saying to the brain, look, this is no longer important right now. Right now, we just need to survive. Okay, we don't need to pay attention to our immune system or our digestive system. So this is what happens right away. Now, imagine that this is the stress response. And if you carry that response on to become chronic, you can imagine the kind of damage it does to you emotionally and physically. But the body and the brain and nature has also given us a way to uh, undo this. And you'll be amazed that we can undo how quickly we can do this. We can do this in three minutes. And how do we do it? The way we do that is we give our, our, our brain a message that look, this situation is something I can cope with. Um, it's not so dangerous. I can do it. Okay. As soon as we do that, the brain will stop sending these emergency signals. And then there is a cycle that goes through. The hormones and chemicals are metabolized and our body returns to our normal function. So we can do that in about three minutes time. Okay? So you can imagine how, what a, what a miracle our body and our, uh, our, you know, nature has given us in our body, okay? Um, now let's just look very, very quickly at what are the signs of stress. 
and why is it important that we take care of ourselves and we not give in uh, to this stressful reaction and make it chronic. Uh, so you can see that it's not just physical symptoms, there are physiological symptoms, there are psychological symptoms, and of course, all of these, the psychological and the physical, they affect our behavior. So you can, you know, very quickly see that each area is being affected um, by stress. Now, how do we deal with stress? I think the first thing that we need to do is something that we call body awareness. And body awareness is, is extremely important in, in recognizing and reducing stress. A lot of us are not aware of the tension that we carry in our bodies. And this is something that has been stressed over and over again. Actually, it started from the East. So our philosophies of Zen or yoga or Sufism stress the body very much. Um, so, of course, now this has been taken up by the West and there's a lot of uh, research that has been done on that and this mind-body relationship. So what we need to understand is that the body is registering stress long before the conscious mind does. Okay, So if we can start to get in touch with our body, if we can start to realize what is the muscular tension, muscle tension that we are carrying in our body, we can realize that our body is sending us a signal. It is telling us, look, there's some stress. Because one point that I, I, I make over and over again, there is no way that your body can be relaxed and your mind is tense. There is a direct connection. If your body is relaxed, your mind will be relaxed. If your mind is tense, your body will be tense. So if you can learn to, to read the signals from your body and relax your body, you will automatically be relaxing your mind. Okay, this is a crucial point that I really would like you to remember. Um, I, want, I want to kind of go through two things in this body awareness um, thing which is one is this uh, technique, which is basically just to be aware of your body. And I'll just, it's a very brief thing that you can try yourselves. And the technique is that you look outside yourself, out, you know, you look around in your surroundings and kind of just note whatever is in your surrounding, you know. So I'm aware that there's a lamp here, there's a clock here, there's a, uh, there's a calendar on my wall. I, I go to the outside and then, I move my awareness to my insides, okay? And I start focusing on my insides. So how is my heart beating? Which muscle of my body is tense? Um, is my stomach gurgling? Okay, again, it's, it's the, the idea of this is to raise awareness of your body. And we never do that. We are always so lost in looking outside, in taking care of or focusing on the outside environment. We never really listen to our body, okay? The other very, very useful technique is called body scanning. And body scanning is basically, I mean, if you want to do it with me, please do. And the way you do it is you close your eyes, you be comfortable, and just start starting from your toe, very slowly move up your body and start looking at any muscle that is tense. And if you sense a muscle that is tense, you tell yourself, one, what you do is you exaggerate it just a little bit, that tension. And then tell yourself, I am doing this. I am hurting myself by doing this. This muscle tension I am producing. And if I choose, I can choose to relax it. Okay? So, I mean, Again, these are all techniques that require practice. But if you learn to do this, and, and what I would really, really encourage you to do is if, if you're not familiar with these apps, please download them. There's an app, very good app, which is called Headspace. Another one is called Calm. And these are free. You can download them. And they are, they're extremely useful to, to teach you these kind of techniques. Um, okay, so, so the next thing that we're going to talk about is 
uh, something that we do all the time. So, uh, you know, why are we talking about it? So this is uh, breathing. And uh, a lot of times when I'm, I'm doing this workshop uh, and I'm seeing all the people uh, that I'm working with, I will say to them, well, when you breathe, what part of your body moves? Uh, can you put your hand on that part of your body? And a lot of times uh, people will put their hands on their chest. Uh, and I say to them, well, yes, that's what we most of us do. But the way nature wants us to really breathe is different. Okay? It's the way that if you, wa if you wash the baby sleeping, uh, which part of that uh, the baby's body moves up and down? It's the stomach. Okay? And if you can breathe, uh, take a deep breath, you will notice that your stomach will go up and down. Okay, and that is the way that will that is most effective, that gets the most blood or the most oxygen into our blood. Um, so in some and that is the way that is most calming for us. So the correct way to breathe is really a very, very useful tool. And it's something that can be practiced. You can only I mean, even if you do it twice a day for five minutes, you will immediately notice a difference. Okay. So again. This is, uh, you know, a breathe, breathing. Uh, uh, you probably know that the Rishis and Sufis and Yogis have all used breathing to to control their body functions, their metabolism, to slow down their metabolism. Uh, and uh, of course, now there are there's uh, you know a lot of literature on on good breathing and deep breathing. And the important thing to remember, and this may be something that you may remember from, recall from your grandparents telling you, your parents telling you that if you're very angry, they might have said to you, calm down, take some deep, deep breaths. Uh, and so you, you see how there is a direct connection. It's a bi-directional connection between emotions and breathing. So, so the, the, the more restless or the more stressed we get, the more our breathing changes with that, the more angry we get, the more our breathing changes with that, the more calm we are, our breathing becomes different. And of course, again, like when I was talking about the body and the mind, uh, if you can learn to control your breathing, you will learn to control your emotions in your mind. It's easier to learn to control our breathing because there are very good techniques to that. Okay? So, if you can just take five minutes each day, morning and evening, and do some good deep breathing, and those techniques are on the net, you can learn them. There, there's no uh, sort of real, uh, very difficult thing about that. Um, it's just learning how to, how to learn uh, to breathe to a count. Um, you breathe up to a count of five. And you learn how to take deep breaths. So basically, it's taking conscious control of the rate of your breathing and the depth of your breathing. And you will see that your body will start relaxing. It's, a, it's, it's an amazing thing. And I think that's what I find so amazing about stress management, that these are all nature's cures. Uh, we don't need to go out to buy any medicine for them. This is all within our body. Okay. So exercise, I don't need to say much about that. I, you, you probably all know this, that exercise is, is very, very important for uh, just not just our body, but also for relaxation, for our stress, for depression, for anxiety. Um, you know, if you can do uh, an, an aerobic exercise is what I mean. And again, uh, you know, this is not just walking around and walking the house or going up and down the stairs twice. It's really actually working out. So, so exercise is a very important part of... Um, okay, and, and the other thing that, that I think, again, you have is visualization, okay? And this is our imagination. So our imagination is an extremely powerful tool and often we use our imagination to make our lives miserable because what we do is we imagine lots of worrisome things that are going to happen to us or that's going to happen in the future. What if this happens? What if that happens? And we are using our imagination to, to do that. If uh, people who have been in solitary confinement have been asked sometimes, what, how did you survive? 
And one of the tools that they used was visualization because they used their imagination to get them to a place that was safer, that was pleasant for them. And this is exactly what we all can do. We can all use visualization to create places for us that are safe, that are happy. Um, and once we do that, uh, our body automatically relaxes. So uh, when I say create a scene, uh, what I mean by that is that if you can think of a time, of a place where you were really happy, where you were really relaxed, where you felt at peace, and not just see that place in your, uh, with, in your mind's eye, but actually go there. So just in your mind, think about how did it smell? What were the noises? Were there birds there? Were there children laughing? Were your friends chatting away with you? Um, what was the temperature like? Was there a breeze? What did the ground feel like when you were walking? So, so you kind of immerse yourself in that scene. And if you can do that, you will realize that as you do that, your body is relaxing. So it's an amazingly powerful tool. And um, I, I don't think we have time. Otherwise, I would do an exercise with you on this. Just uh, So I'm going to maybe skip that and go ahead. Um, the, uh, okay. So the last thing that I want to talk to you about is basically the, the source uh, of stress that, uh, that lies in our thoughts. Okay, so, uh, so again, it is not what's happening around us, but often how we think about what's happening. Okay, this is what can make things much more stressful for us. Okay, so what is happening? Why is it happening? How dangerous is it? Do I have the resources to cope with it? We are talking to ourselves all the time. There is not one second of our lives that we, we are not immersed in self-talk. We don't know that because we don't consciously uh, are not sort of monitoring that, but it's certainly happening. We are saying things to, to ourselves all the time, okay? When, when we are anxious, when we are stressed, we often decide that something is very painful, it is dangerous, it is uh, difficult, and that we don't have the resources to cope, okay? So these are things that we are sent, messages that we are sending to our own selves, okay? Uh, so again, if we monitor our thoughts, and it's extremely important to monitor our thoughts, and if we feel like we are giving ourselves negative messages, I would encourage you to challenge those negative messages. Where is the evidence? How do you know what's going to happen in five years' time? You know, how can you tell that this is going to affect your whole life? How can you tell that you are a loser? Okay. Nobody is a loser in every aspect of their lives. So those kind of messages, if, if your mind is giving you those messages, challenge them. Be, like, be a lawyer. Fight for yourself. Okay? And you will realize that there is often no evidence for these thoughts that come to us. Often we are just predicting bad things to happen. There is, we are not fortune tellers. We don't know what's going to happen. So, so challenge them. Okay, and again, there is another technique that you can look up. It's called deep muscle relaxation or progressive relaxation. It's a very, very good technique. Um, it, it, it's easy to learn, but it requires practice. Okay. Um, again, don't lose your sense of humor. Keep it, okay? Um, and now, uh, just... You also know that there are harmful ways. Please don't, please sort of watch out for these. Um, these are self, these are some things that you might want to incorporate into your lives. All right. And now I am going to finish up and not do this, but just go back. Uh, so I'm going to finish this. I don't know how to do that. But if I can 